May 26, 1998. October, Pearl, Mississippi, three dead. December, West Paducah, Kentucky, three dead. March, Jonesboro, Arkansas, five dead. April, Edinburgh, Pennsylvania, one dead. May, Springfield, Oregon, four dead. Small towns in America are learning what many in the inner cities have known for some time. Kids plus guns spell disaster. But is it that simple? Some surprising answers from the inner city. They talk about, go do something about guns. This is not guns, it's condition the neighborhoods. Meanwhile, those in the gun industry feel equally misunderstood. Get out of the city. Get out into where the rest of America is, where the people at this show come from, and you will see that firearms are used well over 99% of the time for legitimate purposes. Tonight, one nation, two worlds, living under the gun. From ABC News, this is Nightline. Reporting from Washington, Ted Koppel. What may be the most difficult aspect of dealing with the subject of guns in America is the fact that we tend to listen only to those who share our point of view to begin with. In fact, as soon as most of us begin reading a newspaper column or watching a television piece on a gun-related story, we know, or at least we think we know immediately, just where that person is coming from. A lot of you will do that tonight anyway, but if you'll pardon the expression, hold your fire. Just for the record, there are clearly a lot of yahoos on both sides of this issue. But it's important enough, if only because so many people are dying and getting hurt, that it deserves a suspension of judgment. There may actually be some common ground that we can all agree on, and one such area has to do with the question of perspective. Our friend David Turacamo, who spends several months at a time both videotaping and reporting his own stories, David has been examining this story from a couple of vantage points, and we'll be looking at his work both tonight and tomorrow. It may be stating the obvious, but guns play a totally different role in the life of a hunter or sportsman from that of a person living in, say, a drug-infested neighborhood of Philadelphia. Go to any gun show in the country, and you'll hear just that which doesn't mean it isn't true, but neither is it the entire story. If you want to understand one part of the gun culture in this country, start here, Las Vegas. At the annual SHOT Show, that's short for Shooting, Hunting, and Outdoor Trade Show. This is the largest collection of capitalists in the shooting sports industry. Uh, this, this really is a combination trade show, uh, hootenanny, uh, uh, alumni reunion. It's a $30 billion industry that's more than just guns and ammo. It's outfits and accessories and gadgets. Because guns to these people are not only a way of life, they're a state of mind. When they look in the front of that barrel, that's, that's, there isn't any doubt about what's going on there. And nobody's confused in the room about who's who and what's what at that point in time. And, you solve a lot of social arguments instantly by just looking at one of these. I mean, you want to be the city in America that has no guns in, in any of the houses in the city? Marva Gaskins probably would. She understands another part of the gun culture, because she lives it here in North Philadelphia, in a neighborhood they call the Badlands. It came up on the uh, Yeah, it came up here. And see, watch. So they shot into the house? Yes, yeah, see. Holy. In Philadelphia, the rate of gun murders has been going up steadily, while the national average has gone down. That is a gunshot? Yes. Valerie Wall's daughter was shot to death on her front steps. It's kind of hard, you know, having your child for 22 years, talking to her early that day, and not being able to see her no more, you know. Mm -hmm. It's hard for me to come outside, sit on my step. Because if I look down, you know, I'm looking at my child laying down there. I will tell you're going to be on TV. More than 300 uh, people were killed uh, by handguns in Philadelphia last year. You taping now? Most between the ages of 15 and 25. I mean, you're not like soft enough, and if you got a gun and another person got a gun, 
and they just want to like show it off. That's really all it is about around here is like showing off. Recently up here at Broaden Erie, cop was sitting in his car writing out a report. Young guy went on a rampage shooting up the neighborhood up there. And you know, he shot the cops tires out. So otherwise, see, they don't have, they don't even fear the cops. But it's not just the hundreds that are killed every year. There were five in just one weekend last March. But it's the uncounted victims, the ones who are injured and maimed for life or left widowed and orphaned. I'd like to introduce you to Khadija. It was in the emergency room at Children's Hospital that I met a child named Khadija. She's 16 years old. She'd been well, shot in the stomach by her boyfriend. Shot. I got shot January the 27th. I lost all my short intestines. I start school next week for like a half a day. Mm -hmm. I don't really want to go because I don't know how, you know, people going to think and how people going to look at me and stuff. Mm, I can't hold much in my stomach. I can't drink a lot of fluid. Like regular people drink or, or eat, I can't. I think I came a long way and I feel much better. But I wish I could be back like I was. But this town's got a mayor who just won't give up. If I was in a boat and it was sinking and all I had was a little bucket, I'd be, and it was an ocean liner, I'd be bailing out with that little bucket until the water came over my eyebrows. Ed Rendell decided he'd had enough and he was going to do something about it. Now, this is a guy who everybody agrees brought the city back from the brink of financial collapse. If he could fix the city's money problems, he was ready to take on something even bigger. The mayor is putting together the elements for a federal lawsuit against gun makers. It was last July when the local Fox station broke the story. Now sources say the mayor is planning something dramatic to deal with gun violence, and he's setting his sights on a big target, the gun manufacturers. Several major lawsuits against the gun industry have already failed, but Rendell's would follow the pattern of the tobacco case claiming the industry has created a public nuisance by producing millions of weapons which they know are going into the hands of criminals. David Carey's drafted the complaint. It's a question of whether they are responsible in damages for the direct harm, the harm they know they do to the cities. And that, that can start with the 911 call or cleaning blood from the streets, and it could extend to, to the extent of uh, hospital costs, uh, or taking care of an orphan child. So Ed Rendell planned to sue the gun manufacturers in the city where the Second Amendment, which guarantees citizens the right to bear arms, the city in which that guarantee was written. But by January, six months after the story broke, they were still deliberating. Right now, only for, no one has tapped me on the shoulder and said, we'll join you and we'll absorb part of the costs. And I would have to spend, to litigate this case, millions of dollars of the taxpayers' money here in Philadelphia. And I want to make sure that at least we have a chance. So this is really a story about two Americas. One is urban, where guns are about survival. One is suburban, where guns are about sport. One is white, the other is black. What I'd like to show you is the journey I've taken through both. And it all begins on the streets where kids wear t-shirts in memory of the dead. Who was Kevin? My dad. This is ABC News Nightline, brought to you by Honda Accord. See this corner right here? It was average. Somebody get shot here at night. This corner right here. That's all they was doing, like shooting every night. One of the biggest drug corner was. You get anything you want back here, this is a shoot, shooter's alley. Jim Robertson and Patrick Peters are crisis counselors with an organization called the Philadelphia Anti-Drug, Anti-Violence Network. And more to the point, they grew up on these streets and gave me a tour of their city. 357 is the best handgun you can have out here, man. It's a big boy, it's a revolver, and you ain't got to go through that hard shit. And the bullets are so easy to come by. And most of the bullets you come by, you can get for a 357. It's hollow tip, or they got they got um, ball bearings in them. You do something that they think is bad enough, you get shot for it. What does it take? What's bad enough to get shot around your If way? somebody's stupid, like, really has no control, it could take to get shot. It could take. To the doctors at Children's Hospital, gun violence was reaching epidemic proportions. Clothes get you shot. 
Mm-hmm. Jealousy, envy, that gets you shot. These are not hardened kids. These are kids who I think are frightened out of their wits. If we look 20 years ago and we compare kids from 20 years ago to kids today, what is clear is that there have always been a group of kids who are scary. Kids who break the law and kids who break the rules and kids who do all sorts of things. I think that's part of adolescence. If we look around the world, there is nice data from European nations which suggests that rates of delinquency are not very different in European nations from rates of delinquency in this country. What is different in this country is kids can get their hands on a firearm. You already know, everybody knows. No way. We can get a gun anytime we want. Family, I know, we all know. These are two kids I happen to meet on a street corner. Uh, now, family, tell me how easy this gun. You know how guns, you know I'm gonna tell you how guns get got in, can in the mouth. They look like mine. Uh, guns dude. we got, cause motherfuckers, they got licenses, buy them, mm -hmm. then they sell them at another Man. price to on the street, that. and that's how they the get guns the come from the what they call them, them big. No. Up I know there. a boy, I know nah, a boy man. that do this. He got a fucking license, he buy man. guns, and then he sell them to hustlers for a bigger price. And that's how it works. Somebody with a clean record gets a permit, buys the guns from a legitimate dealer, then sells them on the street for a substantial markup. It's called a straw we purchase. Actually, uh, it's a clean gun, it's never been used. They're not like they're getting a gun that's been used in, in crimes. You, 90% of the time, they're getting guns that are still in the boxes, brand new. An hour These cops didn't want their faces shown. They sometimes work undercover. A, a lot of the, the straw purchase, the straws, they'll go and buy guns to try to make a couple bucks. You know, they live in the inner city. They figure they can get a fast buck. Guns is what's happening. Guns and drugs go together. Guns and drugs, and, and it's crime. Crime is a business. You think people want to stop crime? Nah, a lot of folks don't want to stop crime. The city tried to pass tougher gun laws four years ago. They were knocked down by the state legislature. In Pennsylvania, there are more NRA members than anywhere else in the country, except California. Before, the police department could say, why do you want to carry a gun? And if you couldn't come up with a compelling enough reason, then you could not be issued the permit. Well, that was... You can't. But that was that was wiped out. So as a result was, now, pretty much anybody can get a permit to carry. You don't really have to make a great case. You just have to be a criminal. <laughs> if you're, I mean, essentially the litmus test is, are you a criminal? You can have numerous arrests for narcotics, robbery, for any felony, but it's not a conviction. And that person can buy a gun. Half of all the retail gun sales in Philadelphia are multiple purchases. In other words, in half of the sales, someone will buy at least two guns. And almost 20% of the time, they buy between five and nine guns. The, the, what sort of generated this focus on handguns that is now sort of a freestanding uh, initiative, mm -hmm. we were looking at how to make neighborhoods safer for kids. When I first started following this story, everybody said the guy you got to talk to is Mike DeBerardinas. He's the recreation commissioner. In other words, he's in charge of all the parks and sports facilities for the city. I mean, that sounded funny, but actually, this is the guy who got the ball rolling on the issue in City Hall. If you look at the guns that are found in crime scenes in the city, you will find concealable, semi-automatic handguns as the majority, the, I think the overwhelming majority, 8 in 10 or 9 in 10 of crime guns found, tra that are f found at crime scenes and, and traced by the ATF, uh, that's what they are. Once these little handguns were called Saturday Night Specials, and because they keep turning up in crimes, Philadelphia would like to ask a jury, are the manufacturers deliberately producing a weapon for the criminal market? Here we have Phoenix Arms. This is one of the uh, Ring of Fire manufacturers. Fine auto pistols for under $100. Got these tiny guns, extremely appealing for crime use. Uh, the other use for them is for people carrying them in their pockets. They refer to it as a pocket pistol. Um, and uh, they know this means that people who have no training, uh, have never been tested or even, even asked about their, their ability to use self-control, are going to be carrying these in their, in their uh, pockets, in their glove compartments of their cars. Here we have 
9.9 ounces of prevention. It's this tiny Smith & Wesson that'll go, it would go in my shirt pocket and weighs only 9.9 uh, ounces. Uh, inexpensive, extremely high power, rapid firing. Well, maybe not high power rapid fire exactly, but it is small and cheap. Small, cheap, concealable, semi-automatic. Now, people can make their judgments from who's buying them and who's using them. Gun manufacturers get together a couple times a year. There's easily 200 of them in the United States. They're all as different as the faces in their group picture. There's one thing they agree on, it's like the bumper sticker says, it's not guns that kill people, but the people who use them. And I was surprised to find out who agrees with them. They talk about, go do something about guns. This is not guns, you condition the neighborhoods. And what people allowed to happen, people in the neighborhoods. So, you know, we say it's just not guns. See this stuff here? All this for factories. Jobs closed down. Once this area flourished, there were jobs and industry. The area's biggest employer now is the drug dealer. And, and the, my man, you wouldn't know how many deaths I can tell you that happen on this block right now. I can count over seven, seven shootings, uh, seven shootings, deaths related with guns. Nobody was, nobody wasn't never over 17. That's how young they was. And you see all down here, mm -hmm. drug and addicts. And you want to talk about the city in there, about talking about they want to do something about this? You see him stick the needles in his pocket? <laughs> mm -hmm. He's selling needles. Drug haven. Look, he's doing it. He don't even care. This neighborhood accounts for almost two-thirds of the city's drug trade and more than 25% of the homicides. What the f*** wrong with you, man? They're by yeah. selling drugs, taking one of the right. drugs and robbing people. You want to talk about people want to do something about crime? Yeah, right. And the roots of this area's decline go back more than 60 years. This is a map that was drawn up in 1935 by the HOLC. That's a precursor to the Federal Housing Administration. It was used by bankers in writing mortgages. The red areas are considered those that are hazardous, risky investments because they were and are mostly black neighborhoods. It's called redlining, and the map is a self-fulfilling prophecy. It's also where most of the shootings occur. I met Craig McCoy, a reporter with the Philadelphia Inquirer, as he was trying to piece together the life of the city's latest victim. But his profile is very typical of the Philadelphia murder victims. He's a young black man. It's a firearm death. Uh, I believe he has one adult conviction for drugs. Um, he has a pretty extensive juvenile and adult criminal record. And maybe that's the problem. The death of four white kids in Jonesboro or Springfield get immediate national attention. The 400 kids in North Philadelphia, and, well, if you didn't live here, you probably wouldn't know about it. And why have you got so much guns? You got the damn guns to survive around here. Because if you didn't have, you'd be finished. I understood his frustration a couple minutes later when a squad car appeared. This could be Instagram. And started following. Yeah, you know what they could do? Ride right foot by, ain't gonna stop. Sure enough, it was like they deliberately avoided all the streets where the drug dealing was going on, right in the open. Like nothing ain't going on. Well, this was back in September. And since then, there's signs that Rendell's campaign is starting to pay off. For one thing, the city got a new police commissioner in March. And the gun task force, working with ATF, has been identifying and tracking down straw purchasers. And the gun murder rate for the first four months of this year is down slightly. As for Rendell taking on the gun manufacturers, well, this past April, he spoke directly to them, not in court, but at one of their conferences. This is what the people of Philadelphia saw during that week. And ladies and gentlemen, it is tearing the heart and soul out of them. They're frightened, frightened even beyond what reality would dictate. They're depressed, they're saddened, they're despairing. To the people of Philadelphia, guns aren't used for sport, Guns aren't used for recreation. Guns aren't even very successfully used for protection. Guns are used for killing people. But when you talk to these gun manufacturers, you talk to the sports enthusiasts, 
you'll get a whole different picture. The biggest misconception, I think, for people who live in cities, which is where most of the, the, the media are, originate from, the television shows come from, and obviously where most of the population is in the country, is that firearms primarily are anti-personnel items. Now, that's not true. I know that doesn't sound like that's, that's the case for someone in the city, because in the city, they either read about someone using the gun to harm someone or someone using the gun to protect themselves to defend their family. Either one of those is anti-personnel use, and, and because of that, is not a particularly pleasant topic to talk about. But get out of the city. Get out into where the rest of America is, where the people at this show come from, and you will see that firearms are used well over 99% of the time for legitimate purposes. So will Ed Rendell ever actually sue these guys? I wonder if he's backed off because he realized what I have, that what makes this such an impossible issue is not just the NRA and the gun lobby. It's the banks that pulled out and took jobs, industry, and decent housing with them. It's the years of police apathy and the incredible power of drug dealers. It's that and the laws that make getting a gun in this town easier than a driver's license. And the fact that in this country, when you talk about firearms, you discover there are two Americas so radically divided, yet united by guns. Tomorrow night, David Turacamo will talk to the people who manufacture guns, manufacturers who are caught themselves between legitimate sports and hunting enthusiasts and the bloody headlines that tend to dominate our news broadcasts. Part two of Under the Gun on Nightline tomorrow. And that's our report for tonight. For the latest overnight developments, watch Good Morning America tomorrow. I'm Ted Koppel in Washington. For all of us here at ABC News, good night. Nightline is always on with abcnews.com, on the web or AOL. Nightline has been a presentation of ABC News. More Americans get their news from ABC News than from any other source. ABC News, now always on.